Welcome to St. Anthony of Padua Chapel in West Orange on Pleasant Valley Way, 1360 Pleasant Valley Way. Uh, you'll be able to uh, get our address more accurately when you see the graphics later on. <clears throat> and the phone number, you can call us anytime. Uh, we're here to uh, bring uh, the teaching of Jesus Christ in a traditional manner. <clears throat> we have the traditional Latin Mass and we have the traditional sacraments, and we have uh, Sunday school for the young people, prepare them for First Communion, Confirmation, things like that. So this program is also called St. Anthony's Hour, but also it's called Catholic Commentary. So I think it's good now and then to look at the news, like the secular newspaper. I don't mean the religious newspaper, but the secular. Let's look at the news, and let's look at it in the light of Catholic teaching. Um, remember, God is the Lord of the universe. We say, uh, we say Christ the King because God, second person of the Holy Trinity, became man. So Christ is the King. God is Lord and Master of the universe. So he takes a preference to uh, any human interest or any government. Or, and uh, we just had a feast day called a Feast of Christ the King. And we prayed that all the earth would resound from pole to pole with one cry. And uh, praise to the divine heart that wrought our salvation, because Jesus Christ brought us salvation. Anyway, we'll look at, we'll look at the news a little bit. Uh, I have in front of me uh, the, the Star Ledger, uh, probably the largest newspaper in New Jersey. And just looking at it, uh, if you understand the Catholic faith and the teachings of Jesus Christ and then you uh, kind of look at these things in, uh, from a point of view that uh, God is Lord and Master of the universe. Anyway, it says here, this is, this is the kind of thing you'd find in a newspaper frequently, two perish in auto crash at North Corwell Crossroads. Two perish, two people died. A fire results precluding a chance of rescue. Here's the story. Two men were killed yesterday in a fiery head-on collision on West Greenbrook Road, North Caldwell. So-and-so was driving his 84 Cadillac, and so-and-so was driving a uh, 95 Nissan, <clears throat> and they had a head-on collision. They were both doing about 50 miles an hour, and apparently they were confused. Um, one of them, I don't know which one, thought he was in the, uh, the right lane and the other one was in the right lane and the one who should have been in the other lane uh, came over and hit him head on. I mean, no brakes, no nothing. It's just a head on collision is just about the worst kind of collision you can have. <clears throat> well, what's our commentary about that? Well, generally speaking, there's been um, a lot of lack of charity and patience on the road. I, I think if you talk to anybody about that, they'll agree that that's the case. <clears throat> There's a new phenomenon called road rage, where you get angry at the other driver. Well, I, people have always been a little bit peeved at other drivers. I remember the old cartoons that uh, they called people Sunday drivers. They would just come out in, in a say a 40 mile zone, they do 20 miles. And they just wanna, they're out for a Sunday ride. It's just look at the sights, the trees and the fall foliage or, or the houses or whatever. They go, oh, come on, look at this guy. And he's, he's a Sunday driver and he's, uh, then we have a road hog person who, instead of pulling over and driving uh, slowly on the right uh, so people can pass on the left, then, uh, we get a little peeved at that. Truck drivers would get angry because truck drivers have some place to go. You know, they have a deadline and they punch a clock and they got families and they want to get from point A to point B and they don't want to have un unnecessary tie-ups. Generally speaking, truck drivers are very good drivers. They do it for a living, they're professional. <clears throat> but why is there so much road rage now? I mean, not just people being a little peeved, but actually angry. And um, it's happened uh, 
the, the situations which can trigger off-road rage, uh, all of us have experienced that you're coming, I'm coming down Pleasant Valley Way where our church is. <clears throat> I come off Northfield Avenue and I have about half a mile to go before I turn in my driveway. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, a car comes right up in back of me and tailgates me. Now, I'm, I'm not a slow driver. I'm not a pokey driver. I keep the speed limit. And then I put on my uh, directional because I'm going to turn. So I put it on way in advance. Doesn't back off, doesn't slow down. I think he's going to crash into me. And finally, I pull off in the driveway. Zoom! The car goes by. I say, oh, thank God. Was that guy crazy or something? Who is it? I mean, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody come up on the back of your car at high speeds and you have your direction line well in advance that you want to turn and they almost kill you, you know? It's, it's thoughtlessness, okay? It's selfishness. It's lack of charity. Charity means you love, your, you love your neighbor. You love God and you love your neighbor. Now, if he loved the driver of the car, it happened to be me, but if he loved him, he wouldn't make me feel uncomfortable or be sweating bullets as I... Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're, out, when you're out on the road, remember, some of the people driving might, might drive a little too slow. Well, live with it. You know, I, I had a wonderful father... Uh, my dad, uh, one of the most unselfish m people I've ever met in my life. Maybe I'm bragging because he's my father. But And we were poor. We up in Newark, nine children, poor. Didn't have too much, but we had the faith. And uh, my mom would scrimp and save, and we managed. We managed all all right. We all made it fine. We all made it swell, and they passed on the greatest treasure, which was life itself, and they passed on uh, the Catholic faith, the road to salvation, so that we can all be together someday, one big family, at the beatific vision, hopefully, to earn its bread. Well, anyway, uh, Dad, uh, we didn't have a car uh, growing up. Uh, my dad walked to work or took the bus. Uh, on Sundays, we walked to the park. Uh, we walked to church, walked to school. We lived in Roseville section of Newark, and <clears throat> everybody walked. As a matter of fact, I don't think the church had, this big church, St. Rosa Limas, I don't think it had a parking lot. I don't think it did. I mean, that goes to show you how many people walked to church, rain or shine. Uh, snow and cold and heat and whatever. And uh, so we didn't have a car. And uh, when my dad retired, about 65, I guess, he retired, he bought a car. I remember it was a Ford, a little Ford, I forget what they call them. And Pop, at age 65, learned how to drive. Now remember, he's past his peak physically. So, uh, and that was opened up a whole new horizon. He could take mom to the store. They could uh, take a ride down to Spring Lake and walk on the boardwalk or something, you know. But Pop was a slow driver because he learned very late in life. And when you're driving, maybe that guy in front of him is my father or your father, and he, he made sacrifices all his life, and he's a slow driver, so have mercy on him. Don't beep your horn or try to pass him where you shouldn't pass him and get real impatient and run up his back. I'll tell you where this happens a lot. Uh, I mean, if you do that, you know, you're harming an angel and God's going to be very angry with you because Pop was an angel and you're causing pain to this angel unnecessarily. He's not trying to, he's not trying to harm you in any way. He's driving within his capability. You say, oh, he should stay home. Why should he stay home? You don't have to stay home. You know, these one-word cliches about, well, if they're too old to go slow, they should stay home. That's a terrible thing to say. And the same people who say that are going to be old someday. 
it comes back to haunt you, you know. You think you're never going to get older. Hmm? You never, never can think that your reflexes are going to slow down. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get sick, right? <clears throat> well, everybody gets sick sooner or later. And if they don't get sick, they'll have old age. And so have mercy on people. Don't be, you know, on Route 80, 280 and 80, which is not far from our chapel. If you come up to our chapel, come up Route 280 and get off at exit 7. That's Pleasant Valley Way, exit 7 on 280. And then go towards the West Orange side, not towards Verona, towards West Orange. That would be going south, a mile and a half, and you'll see our chapel there, 1360 Pleasant Valley Way. So I'm on 280 quite often, and also on 80, and they have what they call a HOV lane. I think they're going to eliminate it now. They say high occupancy vehicle, and I, I might be in that HOV lane, and uh, the speed limit on 80 is 65 miles an hour, and I'm with someone or a couple of people, whatever, and so I'm keeping the law, and I'm doing 65. There's a guy right behind me, like about two inches away from the back. What am I going to do? You know? I mean, it's just awful, uh, this uncharitableness, this lack of patience. You could actually cause somebody to fret and worry that you have somebody, suppose I had to stop or slow down and so that an animal ran across or, or there was a disabled car. He would smash into the back and probably kill me and the people in the car, you know. As a matter of fact, by law, you're supposed to keep a certain distance from the car in front of you. There's a lot of that stuff now, and I see it connected with the decline of religion decline of faith. I see it connected with all this liberalism. Think of yourself first. It's me, 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 me. Even in this Am Church, this American church, it's your happiness, your fulfillment. It's not God's. It's not following the example of our Savior who humbled himself. Jesus Christ uh, was born in a stable. He lived humbly in Nazareth. And, uh, and he's our model. And, but you don't hear that in the Am Church the American liberal church, you know. Uh, be happy, be happy. Uh, you come first. Uh, and so you become self-centered, egocentric, where the center is the ego. So your time, your energies, you come first. You even, you even see that uh, reflected uh, in athletics, which which is a shame, really. Uh, oh, how we hearken back to the days of uh, Joe D and Willie Mays and Stan Musial and Roberto Clemente and, and Mickey Mantle, you know. These skill athletes, these uh, tremendous athletes would hit a home run, trot around the bases and tip their hat, you know. Not all this uh, excessive excessive celebration. You know, I see it in football, basketball. Now, I'm not talking about the end of the game. I'm talking about during the game, you know. I mean, I, I think it's all tied in with this look at me, this self-centeredness. Uh, a guy, a lawyer told me one time, he, we were talking about this, and he doesn't like that demonstration either. It's so bad that a lot of people turn off the television now. I mean, I, I used to love the uh, the uh, National Football League, you know, the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears and Green Bay Packers, you know, uh, normal American young man. I like those games. And uh, uh, lots of times, that's it. I'm turning it off. The guy makes a touchdown and he starts dancing in the end zone. Said, I'm not going to watch that. What is he doing that for? Oh, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know. They, had, they have to start legislating, uh, legislating against it. It's all tied in with this loss of religion, believe me. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. It's, uh, it's uh, where man is deified. Man becomes God. Your success is what counts. But anyway, I was talking to this lawyer, and he said, uh, you have a court case, and the court case, <clears throat> let's say, might go on for a couple of weeks. And uh, he said, uh, so let's say... Uh, the prosecution. Uh, I think the prosecution is first, I think. Let's say a criminal case. 
So uh, the prosecution calls in witnesses which will strengthen his prosecution. So he brings in a witness up on the stands and the, the witness testifies uh, favorably for the prosecutor. And then they go, hey, he starts cheering, hey, yeah. Wait a minute, the case isn't over. You gotta bring up another witness, and then the defense, you know? But he says, what's happening in these games is, it's like during a, a trial that uh, the people celebrate as they go along the line. Not at the end when the trial or the verdict, guilty or not guilty. The game's not over, the final gun hasn't sounded. And I'll tell you, a lot of people are, uh, are very much disenchanted by that. Uh, it's kind of an unspoken thing. It's, uh, it's not their idea of modesty. In, uh, when you have ability, whatever it happens to be, we respect a person is modest about it. They thank God for it and they, and they consider it a responsibility to be skillful in something. Uh, but we don't see that, not too often. Uh, we don't just see a tip of the hat or something like that. We see this wild, self-centered celebration. So I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. Now let me swing over. We're talking about sports a little bit. I have here uh, the newspaper um, about the um, NBA, which is the National Basketball Association. They're having, um, I guess it's a strike. They call it a work stoppage or they call it a lockout. And I haven't followed it that closely. You can't follow everything, but <clears throat> they had to cancel uh, all of the regular scheduled games in November. The season was supposed to start in the first week of November. Now, all the exhibition games prior to that in October were canceled. And the month of November, all the, the uh, games have been canceled. I mean, we're talking about a lot of games, a lot of season ticket holders, a lot of players, a lot of referees, a lot of concession stands, you know, that are affected by this. I don't know what the issues are. I presume that the, the owners of this team do not want to give in to the demands of the players. The players are making these demands and they have become a union and they're making certain demands and the the owners are saying, no, we're not going to comply with those demands. So rather than give in to these commands, we're going to lock out. Lock out sounds like a dramatic thing, but it means, look, you're not going to come in and use our facilities. While we're negotiating, we're not going to let you use our gym and our basketballs and our sneakers or whatever else. So that's what it amounts to. I got a feeling that this whole strike uh, or lockout is uh, because of uh, excessive demands on the part of the players. I'm not sure of that, but there are certain principles that the church teaches about work stoppages and strikes and boycotts, okay? You never hear much about this, and I've urged our bishops to make some, give some principles on this. Now, uh, work stoppages, strikes, boycotts are not permissible unless there's a very serious reason uh, there's, uh, there's some great injustice being done and innocent people do not get hurt by it, see. You can't just strike or boycott for any old reason because innocent people suffer. Like if you have a strike, well how about the guy who uh, owns a restaurant uh, right near the, uh, the arena, say right near Madison Square Garden and he, during the season, uh, maybe 30 or 40 percent of his business comes from the basketball games. Well, he's losing out. He's an innocent party, you know, and uh, he's not involved in the, the situation there. So uh, we have to be very careful about those things. Uh, the uh, I would say offhand that the the players in the in the NBA are very well paid. We got some very really big heavy hitters like Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing and people like that, <clears throat> but even the rank and file, you might say, players as they come, they're pretty well paid. Now granted, your lifespan in the NBA is not long. Some of the people, like Michael Jordan, has played, what, almost 15 years, I think. But a lot of players only last a year or two or three. They get a bad knee or an ankle or, 
or someone else comes along, some college hotshot, and then they don't make the team. So you do, wanna, you do want to um, get as much uh, as you can from the owners. And the, um, there's always been this struggle between management and labor, you know? And there's always been that struggle. Um, sometimes management is unfair. Sometimes they're very fair. And sometimes the labor force is um, making excessive demands, and sometimes they're making like reasonable demands, you know. So it's it's not that easy to to uh, settle, and I, I don't attempt to settle that. But there are certain guidelines on that, you know. And um, you don't always side with management like they're bad because they own. Uh, try to put yourself in a position where you would own a, a team. Now, why do you own it? You could lose your shirt. I mean, you take the risks. You made the investment. <clears throat> you, I mean, uh, lots of times a team will go bankrupt. Uh, so since you're taking the risks and taking the investment, I would think that in this society in which we live, free enterprise, that you should, if you make it, there's nothing wrong with making it big because you could lose a lot. Now, a player doesn't take those big risks uh, like management does. Matter of fact, the players, if they make money, like I use Michael Jordan because everybody knows his name, but if he takes his money and he invests it into a managerial situation in a free enterprise, he could lose it all. You know, <clears throat> there was a tennis player, his name was Bjorn Borg, who won the U.S. Open, won Wimbledon. Uh, he, he was very good. Uh, from uh, Scandinavia, Borg. Uh, had a great forehand, <laughs> a topspin forehand, as they say. And uh, his, his big rivals were Jimmy Connors and McEnroe and all those guys. And uh, he retired early. He said, uh, I forget what, at 27, he said, well, I'm going to retire. And he went back to Sweden and invested his money. He became management. He invested his money. He lost it all. I think it was a line of clothing. I forget, restaurants. And so that happens, you know. So uh, I guess he got a taste of what it would be to kind of invest your money in. But anyway, in all these things, charity and all these things, justice, and we have to uh, <clears throat> think of ourselves, but think of the other guy too. And uh, the church uh, has always uh, felt that sports were good for people. It's a good, wholesome outlet. Uh, many Catholic people, many Religious people have been involved in sports. It's been a good outlet. Sure, it can be abused like anything. It can be done too much. It could keep you away from Mass on Sunday. You don't want that to happen. <coughs> it, uh, it could, uh, it's, a good, it's a good thing, sports. We recommend it for young people because you learn how to work as a team, teamwork. You learn how to lose because you're going to lose in life. Uh, everything doesn't fall your way. You have heartache and disappointment. You learn how to cope with that. You learn how to cope with success, with winning. Are you going to be a gracious winner, a humble winner? You see, a lot of good things about it, really. Plus, it keeps you physically fit, and it's a good distraction. You know, lots of times people will have thoughts of depression or temptations against holy purity and, uh, you know, other unwelcome thoughts. And, and to have a, a wholesome activity like athletics is God-given, I would say. You take part in it. If you feel depressed, get outside, go to a ball game, or hit the ball around, or if you feel, if you, if you feel like you're being tempted with all these unwelcome thoughts, get busy, you know, keep your mind busy, keep your body busy. Don't overdo it, you know, take a walk, jog around. Uh, the first defense uh, when we have unwelcome thoughts like, uh, I'll say, sins of impurity, okay? The first defense is distraction. Think of other things, other wholesome things. Then you turn to prayer. We have the Blessed Mother here in the Rosary, you see. And use natural means and use supernatural means to follow the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the example of the saints. That's how you do it, see? Use natural means, these wholesome God-given things, and supernatural means which is the Holy Eucharist, the Sacrament of Penance, uh, Good Companionship, the Rosary, Novena Prayers, 
spiritual reading, reading the scriptures I have here, uh, a small copy of the New Testament here on this table. Read the New Testament and uh, you'll see the example of Jesus Christ leap off the pages. You'll maybe visualize Christ and the Blessed Mother and, and his apostles, you see. And you'll see how uh, our Lord will come alive to you. Our Lord is alive, but he'll become more uh, apparent and dramatically alive in your mind when you read the New, the, uh, New Testament. So just to kind of wrap things up here, uh, our chapel is in West Orange, Pleasant Valley Way. I'll tell you, we're right near the National Guard Armory on Pleasant Valley Way, West Orange, and we're near Kessler Institute. A lot of people heard of that. <clears throat> they had some famous people in Kessler, and um, we're on that same road there, Pleasant Valley Way, 1360. Our masses uh, begin on Sunday at 7.30. We have no Saturday night mass. 7.30, 9, and 11 on Sunday morning. Come bring your missile. Wear a little head covering if you have it. If not, that's okay for the gals. And you should dress up nice, you know, and uh, because you're going to visit uh, the tabernacle where our Lord is present and where we offer respect and reverence. <clears throat> so we'll give you a nice blessing in Latin. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti Descendus Super Vos, et Mani et Semper Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. Go in peace and may the Lord be with you. Amen.